Whether you're a longtime LMDA member, someone just beginning your career, or joining us just for today, you are welcome here. Two years ago, as I became president-elect of LMDA, I addressed this body in the opening session of the 30th anniversary conference in New York with some disruptive insights and significant challenges. If you weren't there uh, and are curious, you can look it up on HowlRound TV, which uh, was there and recorded us. Hi, HowlRound. A year later in Portland, LMDA President Beth Blickers handed me the reins of the organization and said, now you gotta make good. Gulp. While there's still so much to do, I'm proud to say that we've made some positive strides in the areas of transparency and access including an open call for executive and committee members, expanded eligibility for early career membership fees and conference registration, open submissions for the Elliott Hayes Award, and an open call for proposals to this conference. We asked you what you wanted to talk about, and we created a conference open invitation. I do think it's important to stress that this year's is an outward-facing conference, not only because of theme, but also because of location. The city we are, Berkeley, California, with its long history of activism, and this venue, uh, the Ed Roberts campus. Uh, Ed Roberts was uh, a Cal student um, with a physical disability um, based on contraction polio. He was one of the first uh, physically disabled students to graduate from Cal. He became an activist on campus and in the area, uh, he died, and, and he was a leader in the independent living movement for people with disabilities. He died in 1995, um, and uh, after his death, based on all of his work, people said, you know what, particularly here in the East Bay, there are a lot of organizations serving people with disabilities, but they're spread out, and they're hard to get to. What if we put them all in one place, do a one-stop shop? And so, uh, the mayor of the city of Berkeley then and a lot of nonprofit organizations began uh, the long haul of creating this space, the Ed Roberts campus, which was designed and finished in 2010. And it is a nonprofit organization, but it's also a hub for a lot of other nonprofit organizations that serve people with disabilities. It is important to have an accessible space, so you'll see uh, accessible restrooms and accessible ramps. Um, this is, we're committed to being a, a fragrance-free building for people with chemical sensitivities and just considering access all around. So when we started to think about um, this year's conference, we were already thinking about the themes of access um, and activism and art and where we are um, in the world. And this was already along in the planning before uh, the election in November last year, which shifted a lot of people's thinking about who we are, where we are, who has access um, to what. And I thank our board member, Brad Rothbart, for saying, hey, we're gonna be in Berkeley, why don't you check out this campus? And so we did, and we came here, and we thought, oh, this space is just perfect. Um, this room uh, is open to the public. It's gonna be open to the public today and tomorrow. They're gonna be, we're gonna be here, but so are the rest of the public. The tenants of the building, the people who are served by this space, and anyone else is welcome here in this space. And so this is an outward facing conference. We're gonna think about the work that we do as literary managers and dramaturgs and all of the different hats that we wear. And um, we're gonna be like, how, we're gonna ask questions about who are we? How are we in community? How do we think about access? Who has access to making art? Who has access to engaging in the art making? Um, and we're gonna try to ask ourselves really hard questions about, well, we can think these things theoretically, we can talk about these things, but how do we walk the talk? And we're gonna do it in this space. It's about walking the talk. We acknowledge that we are on the territory of the Muwekma, Ohlone, and Chitinyo peoples. And so as fantastic as this space is, and as much as it serves, it's on land with a long history, and we wanna acknowledge that throughout the conference. I am now gonna hand the mic over to Coriana Moffitt, the VP of conferences for LMDA, as well as the conference coordinator, as well as part-time administrative director covering Danielle Car Carroll's maternity leave is here. And so she's just all around superwoman. Um, and 
Brianna Moffat. Hi. <coughs> On top of that, I've made myself have this really lovely raspy voice, so stick with me through this. I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces. I want to get a chance to meet every single one of you. Um, so I just have some housekeeping. Uh, as Ken was saying, this is an open space. Let's embrace it. Um, in this room, this is the atrium. This is where our plenary sessions will be held. This will be live streamed on HowlRound. And then uh, behind you, we have the Osher Education Center. That's where uh, many of our concurrent sessions will be happening in A, B, and C. So we'll see you there later. Um, also, I want to have all of our volunteers raise your hands. All right, these are the volunteers. Thank them. <laughs> Wonderful. We could not do this without them. Um, they're donating their time to make this happen. I really encourage everyone to introduce yourself to them, say hi, ask them what they're interested in and why they're here. I also want to give a huge uh, thank you on behalf of Ken and I for the conference planning team. It really took a village to put this together, but we have a great village, and I'm so thankful for all of the support. It, we were on this as soon as Portland closed, and we're about to jump on to the next one. Um, all right, on that, if you uh, haven't yet connected to the internet, you can visit the desk, and they can give you the password. I'm just doing a little housekeeping here. Uh, all right, I don't know if you remember, but there was, we have a history of taking over Twitter at these conferences. So I want to remind you to use hashtag LMDA17 on all your posts, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we're going to collect them. It's a way that we can digitize and keep track of conversations that happen outside of this space and that we can bring in people who uh, are watching on HowlRound as well. So hashtag LMDA17. I also want to let you know that an octoroon is confirmed for this evening. So we're going to be heading over to Berkeley Rep, and we'll have more info on that later. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. So um, uh, in terms of access and just and activism, uh, this conference, you may notice that we have fewer paper materials. We are earth friendly this year besides me. Forgive me <laughs> for this. Um, but if you, uh, you can download the PDFs, they're on our website. They've been sent out to everyone. And we invite you to follow along in that way. Uh, also, you'll notice that this campus, uh, they uh, compost and recycle. So I invite you to investigate that as we keep this earth <laughs> of ours as long as we can. All right, that's all I've got for now, and Ken will fill in anything that I've forgotten. So I look forward to meeting all of you throughout the rest of the three days. Thank you, Coriana. Thank you, Coriana. Um, so we bra we're basically running the conference on um, uh, three documents. We have our, um, our session schedule, which is three pages. It's kind of a grid. Um, we have our, uh, our sessions manual which gives descriptions of every session. So we're here in the atrium. We have OSHER A, B, and C in the Corette boardroom upstairs. These five spaces, all our sessions are going to be in. So if you're lost, just like stand in the middle and like look in each room and be like, where should I be? Because everything is right here. Um, and if you have any questions, just you know, ask uh, one of us in a t-shirt um, and we'll uh, guide you to the right space. We also do have a couple of printouts of the sessions manual and the session schedule at the registration desk. So if you don't have a screen accessible, just like go up there, look over, see what where you want to be. We're gonna have um, we have a, a an open doors policy for our sessions. So when you um, go in one, and if you want to like hear something, just you know, be respectful, be quiet, and like if you want to step out and hear something else, feel free to move around. Um, and just you know, uh, be as quiet as you can as you're moving from one session to the next. Um, we have plenary sessions. All those plenary sessions, we're all going to be in this space, everyone together, um, hearing the and breathing the same air, same time. And when we run into concurrent sessions, we're up to five different spaces, um, just to give everyone a chance to, and uh, us to be able to break into smaller groups to have more intimate conversations uh, and engage in the material. So we're going to try to, when we're in plenary spaces, give you instructions, one thing to the next, and um, point you in the right direction. Um, but, but feel free, you know, we're in a pretty intimate crowd, 110, I think, 120 people. 
um, are going to be engaged with us over the next few days. Um, so just engage with us in the do-it-yourself spirit of this conference, and everyone will find their way. Um, and there's a lot of people to point you uh, in the right direction. So what we're going to do now is kick off our conversation um, with a fantastic panel. So panelists, if you can come up to the stage um, and grab a seat. All right, fantastic. So what I'm going to do first um, is uh, read short bios of all of our panelists. Um, and I just want to like mention that these short bios that I'm going to uh, read are just scratching the surface on how accomplished and invested these folks are, um, particularly with respect to the themes of our conference. So I'm going to try to read uh, left to right. So Gretchen Fair, hey, um, serves as managing director at the Berkeley Playhouse. She was most recently associate general manager at San Francisco's uh, American C Conservatory Theater. Gretchen spent six years in New York City where she was company manager for over a dozen plays and musicals at the Public Theater. Before joining the public, she had various management producing positions at Encores, New York City Center, New York Musical Theater Festival, Prospect Theater Company, and The Acting Company. Gretchen spent two summers as company manager for the Weston Playhouse Theater Company in Vermont and helped reopen the Napa Valley Opera House as artist service manager and house manager. She holds a BA in theater from the University of Vermont and an MFA in theater management from Florida State University. All right. <laughs> that, that's Gretchen and that's just like this much of all that she's uh, accomplished in her young career. Yeah. Uh, this is great, and this is like we want audience response. The whole conference is going to be a conversation. So, you know, snap, yelling out, however you engage in a way that's comfortable for you. Um, uh, next to her is Carmen Morgan. She is, uh, she is a national consultant uh, leading conversations at the forefront of the field of equity, diversity, and inclusion issues. She's the founder and director of Art Equity, a national program that provides tools, resources, and training to support the intersections of art and activism. She's provided leadership, development, organizational planning, and coaching for staff, executives, and boards for over 100 nonprofit organizations, um, including Oregon Shakespeare Festival and CCG and the NEA. That's just three. That's over 100. So you can just imagine. Do Keep I have going. to be after her? Um, <laughs> No, I'm going to skip Patrick. Um, <laughs> she is also on the faculty of Yale School of Drama, where she addresses issues of identity, equity, and inclusion in the arts. Her work is rooted in popular education, community organizing, and a commitment to social justice. She remains dedicated to community building and activism and has worked in the nonprofit sector for over 20 years. Yesterday, we had a pre-conference of about 40 of us here. Um, and uh, Carmen and her colleague and our colleague, Lydia Garcia, um, led uh, 40 of us through uh, a really down and dirty one day, let's dive into these issues, no fear, um, which was really terrific. And so LNDA as an organization is now beginning its partnership with Art Equity so that we become the organization that we want to be. Uh, and it's a continual uh, evol evolvement, but we started the process. So thank you. Um, yeah, no, 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 this is great, and we can totally agree to disagree. <laughs> for me, for me, for me, it, it, you know, it was a little bit dirty, because we're all facing places where we have to experience and face our own discomfort, and for some of us, that's clean, and others of us, that's dirty. <laughs> all right, all right, great. Um, so I'm not going to skip Patrick. Patrick Dooley started Shotgun Players, our very close neighbor here, uh, in 1992 in the basement of a pizza parlor with a few friends and a desire to make great theater that was affordable to folks who made minimum wage. Patrick has directed over 40 plays, including Beardo by Jason Craig and Dave Malloy, Penelope Skinner's 
the Village Bike, Carol Churchill's Strike Ryan owners, and the West Coast premiere of Tom Stoppard's Coast of Utopia. So th there were over 40 shows, that's just four of them. Um, committed to theater as a form of activism, Patrick led an effort in 2007 to make the Ashby stage just a block away, the first 100% solar powered theater in America. As if he weren't busy enough, in 2016 he became the chair of the Berkeley Cultural Trust and helped organize a campaign to increase Berkeley's arts funding for the first time in 14 years. We, we just we just got it. We just got another one this year. So another what? Another increase. Oh, so he's got so two, two years, increases. Two years in a row. Two and two. And that doesn't happen without some activism and a advocacy. Um, next to Patrick is Karen Altree PM. An accomplished director, actor, dramaturg, workshop facilitator, and acting instructor, specializing in social justice theater, new works development, and community access to the arts. Ms. PM is the director of the Red Ladder Theater Company, to which she has to dash right after this. So forgive her for not sticking around and chatting with us, because she clearly would want to. Um, but she's got work to do, important work. Um, the Red Ladder Theater Company is a nationally acclaimed, award-winning social justice theater company, which empowers marginalized populations in our community by helping them develop positive life skills through the art form of theater. While her work may sometimes be seen in traditional theater settings, it is more often found in art alternative venues, such as prisons, shelters, halfway houses, community centers, and anywhere you find participants hungry to connect with their creativity and express their artistry. Thank you, Karen, for being here. Um, and next to Karen is Nina Marita who's the artistic director of Crowded Fire Theater, a critically acclaimed, intrepid, female-led company dedicated to developing a fierce contemporary theater canon that reflects the plurality of our world. Previously, she served as the as ar artistic associate at Berkeley Repertory Theater and a founding member of its ground floor program, which we're gonna visit, some of us, on Friday, as board president of Shotgun Players and founding member of Bay Area Children's Theater. So she's known around. In 2015, Mina was honored to share her story on TEDx, and this year she was chosen as one of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts 100 for asking questions and making prov provocations that will shape the future of culture. Thank you, Mina, for being here. And to my immediate right is Martine Keegreen Rogers who's a freelance dramaturg who has worked with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Louisville Orchestra, and Court Theater. And she is also assistant professor in the theater arts department at SUNY New Paltz. She is currently working on a manuscript with Jesse Portillo entitled In the Studio, Dramaturgy and Stage Design, which is under contract with SIU Press. And most thrilling for all of us here, she is beginning her president-elect year at LNGA. Thank you, Martine. for being here. Um, so this past year, uh, the board of LNGA decided to, if we're gonna be serious about issues of access, that we, we realized we didn't have an equity, diversity, and inclusion statement, which we've expanded now to include land and territory. So we have a draft and it's gonna be continuing uh, to evolve. So I've asked Martine to just start us off by reading it. So there's some context here for what we're doing organizationally, organizationally at Lambda. And then we solicit your feedback throughout the conference. Thank you. And we are very serious about wanting your feedback. So please let me know if there's something that you feel like we can do better in terms of this statement. So um, if you want to just see it or whatever, please let me know. I can email it to you, whatever, if you can take some opportunity to take, to, to just digest it. LMGA aims to help create stories within the theater and all other art forms in which dramaturgs are employed that reflect a broad spectrum of authentic experiences in our diverse global community. As such, we believe in the power of intersectionality defined as the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and in interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage and are committed to provoking 
addressing and advocating for issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, and land territory. Our membership is dedicated to fostering an environment of respect, celebrating our differences, and seeing the principles above reflected in the composition of our meeting rooms, programming, and recruitment. Thank you. Thanks, so that gives you a little bit of, of context. And we were, um, yesterday at, at our um, art equity workshop, uh, we committed as an organization not to just like spend eternal time wordsmithing um, this statement, but then to develop uh, as a result of this conference and the conversations we have together um, as a community to develop an action plan. So we can say we're committed to this, but what does this mean? What are we going to do to be able to walk this talk and, uh, and actually make an impact in our organization, but so that affects the field, so that affects the community um, and the world in which we live. So this panel, what I've asked the panelists to consider um, are what are the most pressing issues for them in their work and what they see in the world in terms of our themes of access, activism, and art. These are very passionate people who are passionate uh, about many things and one or more of those three A's, access, activism, in art. So we're going to start now giving um, each panelist uh, three to five minutes to uh, just start to um, give us some insight uh, into their work and our themes. So what I'd like everyone in the audience to do, if you've got something to jot down notes on, is jot down for yourselves. What are the most pressing um, questions for you in your work with respect to why we're gathered here uh, around this particular theme? We're going to invite people to um, engage with uh, some, uh, we, we have some post-its up there. We're gonna, we have some action sessions um, embedded into the conference in which we're going to actually talk, not just talk about these themes, but like figure out what we can do individually in our work as a community. Um, so this kickoff panel is meant to like get us all thinking and we're going to pursue these themes and these most important questions throughout the conference. Make sense? Cool. All right. This is a this is an interactive conference, interactive session. So I'm going to ask um, Carmen to start since we got the gears turning um, yesterday. And uh, what's most pressing for you, Carmen? Uh, first, let me just say thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, my team. Uh, thank you, LMDA. Can you all hear me? Feels like. Uh, yeah, maybe like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just. Uh, I was just thanking um, LMDA for this opportunity. It's, it's uh, great to be here. Um, yesterday, one of the things I shared was that I feel that um, as dramaturgs, you all are um, inside of spaces and um, have such uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to um, be um, uh, strategic, um, uh, to use your access uh, in these spaces, uh, you know, for good. So thank you. I think it's. Uh, the your leadership in the field, your commitment to these issues, um, I, f I feel that it's a game changer. I think that it's important. Uh, so thank you both. Um, I uh, I'm going to start with what is very real to me, um, and I, I some of you may know this, and I certainly uh, led with this yesterday when we did the training. Uh, unlike a lot of you, you know, um, the arts isn't the field that I studied in. I think that it's wonderful. Um, I think that it's necessary, uh, but you know, I come out of a, a, a community organizing background, a, a civil rights background, and came into the arts really about 10 years ago by the invitation of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, uh, asking the question of you know, whether community organizing skills and practices can actually inform institutions. And the answer was yes, and I think that it continues to. Uh, but because of that, what the, the, the pressing, urgent issues for me are the pressing, urgent issues uh, in my community and so many uh, communities that I'm close to. It's what queer people of color are struggling with. It's what non-binary folks are struggling with. Uh, the number one targeted community are trans folks and particularly trans women of color. Um, so I'm preoccupied with that. And so I come to this, the arts community, with an appeal, really, uh, because I know what it's like, uh, you know, um, I know activists. Um, I still consider myself an activist. Uh, and they, they do incredible work. 
You know, I mean, I work with folks who chain themselves to the federal building. Uh, we are out there protesting in the streets, uh, direct action. Uh, we are litigating uh, from every vantage point. But what I know is really, and you all know this, the arts is where we can change people's hearts and minds. And so I see myself in this interesting, I would say, kind of arc in my career, um, maybe in the second half of it or even more than that, I don't know, um, really turning my attention to uh, you all as artists. Uh, I know right after the elections, I was really honest with folks, the day after the elections, I was in New York and with a group of uh, folks uh, who were, um, you know, a, a group of uh, uh, um, artists who were uh, um, emoting, uh, crying, uh, wringing hands. Uh, we were literally pacing the room. Um, and one of the things that I said to them is, folks, honestly, you all are going to need to stand in the breach. Uh, Artists are being called upon to stand in the breach. I see your work ghost light. Um, I see you all becoming sanctuaries. Sanctuary theaters are now sanctuaries um, for folks who um, are being targeted. Uh, and I um, see some theaters saying, we're really clear that we're a social justice organization, first and foremost. Can a theater be a social justice organization, first and foremost? So for me, that is, thank you. Thank you, my sister. Um, so for me, that's what's pressing, that's what's urgent. Urgent. What our communities are having to respond to and uh, the lack of sometimes systemic structural supports for them, uh, we're turning to the arts. We're needing you all to stand in the breach. Uh, so just two more quick things. I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to do some little bit of organizing that we can do. Uh, right now, we are dealing with many arts organizations where there is a really big gap uh, between their own capacity and really what the community needs. Uh, some of them are well-intentioned and they're beginning to say, hey, you know what? Maybe we should uh, reflect the community a little bit more. Um, wonderful. Uh, but you know what the community needs, the sense of urgency that's coming from the communities, there's a huge lag time there. So these organizations, some of them very large, are it's taking them a while to turn that corner. So one of the things that we need is we need folks on the inside of those organizations strategically uh, who can really support um, and hold them accountable. So that's one thing, and I just, I feel like everybody in this room, you all know them, you work with them, you're on the inside. Um, don't let things go unchecked. You'll be okay. Speak truth to power. What do you have to lose? You know, uh, if what is informing you are the needs of our communities on the outside, when you are in that room and someone is misappropriating somebody else's culture or yet another racist, sexist thing is being sent, said and going down, speak up. So, so that's, that's, that's one piece I want to add. The, the third thing that I want to say, and then I'm going to uh, hand this off, is you all, you know, there are about 17 open artistic director positions, leadership positions, right now at this time. Is there a way that we can be strategic and organized to demand of these theaters that they've got to have women in the final round? They've got to have folks with disabilities in the final round. They've got to have people of color in the final round. They've got to have out, open, queer identified folks who have great politics in the final round. I just want to read the name of these, in these uh, theaters. Can I do that? Uh, because uh, there is a letter that's going around um, and we need folks to sign on to the letter. We want to send the letter to the board of directors at these theaters and we want to send this letter also to um, the uh, search firms. Uh, and in fact, that's another need. That's another need because there are folks who are saying, who are the search firms that are doing active recruitment? And I know that there's some folks out there that are really well-intentioned, but um, we have uh, also heard stories that we just need more intentionality. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read these. Uh, these are theaters who either have openings now or they are coming up soon, and they have gone on record as saying that they are going to be searching for uh, new leadership. We need to be filling these positions, folks. 17 theaters, this is a moment. Theater Under the Stars, Alabama Shakespeare Theater, the Geffen Playhouse, American Conservatory Theater, Berkeley Rep, Denver Theater Center, City Theater, Pittsburgh Public Theater, Georgia Ensemble Theater, Woolly Mammoth, Ordway, Theater Works Silicon Valley, Theater Works Colorado, Shakespeare Theater, 
10,000 things, looking glass. And recently we just heard officially center stage. Kwame has uh, decided to leave. Folks, 17, this is an opportunity. Let's do something. Okay. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Carmen. Um, so we're gonna try to do a couple of things um, at this conference, which is to think big picture, and so that's part of the bigger picture. That, um, but often, you know, w w we think that, but then we gotta we gotta work locally, and so the next four people are in this community, um, in the Bay Area, and so they're gonna talk about what's most pressing for them in the big picture, but also what they're doing specifically. Um, in this community. So I'd like to hand the mic to Karen next. Um, maybe it, is Phaedra here? Yes. Fader's gonna, we're gonna talk about her project um, on our program, but she will be the point person for this particular project. Great. Uh, so uh, when, when Ken was asking us to think about uh, the, the issues that are of concern to us or um, w what, I, what I find to be problematic sort of sort of certainly popped up for me with regard to art access and activism because all those things come together every day in all the work that I'm doing. Um, I would say that uh, over Red Ladder's 25 year history, we have always been committed to providing access, uh, which is why the majority of the work that we do is in men's and women's prisons, in juvenile hall, in women's shelters, in foster centers, et cetera. Um, and what I'm seeing more and more, because in the last year or so, a lot of our work has really shifted into the prison system. We're very fortunate uh, to be one of a handful of arts organizations in the state of California that has been uh, contracted by the state as part of the state of California's arts and corrections program. Um, thank goodness for Governor Jerry Brown, who uh, reinstated the program. Uh, initially with a $2 million pilot three years ago that we were part of, that has expanded now to six million dollars, and next year we'll go to eight million dollars, and so uh, and so. Currently, uh, we are in six prisons across the state every week, and starting next month we will be in eight prisons uh, throughout Northern California every week, working with men and women. Uh, and I want to get to the issue of trans women of color, who uh, many of those that we are working with are housed in men's facilities. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But what I have found to be uh, so concerning to me in working with this particular population is that uh, the reason that so many of these folks are there, uh, and they are artists, in we, we create an ensemble of artists, and so they are we are reconnecting them to their creativity, uh, providing them with those tools, and then setting them free to use those tools to share their voices and to create devised works that speak to the issues that are important to them. And so over a three month residency, three month period of time, they will develop a piece that speaks to what is important to them and, and what it is that they have to say. Uh, and so what I'm finding for all of these artists with whom we're working is that uh, so many of them are there because they bought the lie. Many of the people that we're working with were uh, sentenced as adults at the age of 16, 17, uh, and are now serving 25 years to life for uh, having had impulse control issues as an adolescent, right? Everybody, everybody has impulse control issues as an adolescent. And uh, the problem is that, that they, they bought the lie, right? So from the time that they were very young, someone or someones or their community or the power structure told them who and what they would be and put them in a box that said, all you're gonna amount to is a gangbanger, is a thug, is uh, a, a sore on society. And they didn't have any other models to show them that that was not necessarily the case. And so they became the only thing that they thought was possible for them. So in engaging with them in our workshops, the first thing that we wanna do is reconnect them to their creativity 
and open up their access to their imagination because the only way that they're able to make another choice for themselves is to first imagine that it's possible and to imagine those other things that they can be. And so then we're seeing these young men and women who suddenly are, are thinking very differently about their role in society and what they can become and the voice that they have to share that with other people and to make sure that others understand uh, sometimes what it is that they've gone through, but sometimes just their own perception of the political climate. Uh, we, had, we had a group of uh, men down in Soledad create a piece uh, that was about a zombie apocalypse, which they created because uh, they looked at what had just happened politically with the election, and the first thing that they realized is that uh, for as much as our country is going to hell in a handbasket out here, their lives day to day inside are not changing very much. And so in their piece, here was this zombie apocalypse that took over the entire nation, and the heroes of the story became the men and women in prison because they were the only ones who were sequestered from the rest of the madness. <laughs> and so what's important to me, because we have always worked, we, we work with preschoolers on up through uh, adults with autism, you name it. And, uh, and what I'm seeing more and more is uh, how much the preschoolers we work with uh, are fortunate to be able to have that kind of work because if these men and women with whom we're working had had opportunities to connect with their creativity earlier, to imagine earlier that they could have a voice in our society and, uh, and share that with people to, to be able to uh, adjust people's worldview, then they might not be in the position that they are in. And that sort of brings me to the next uh, concern that I have with regard to access. So we're doing our best to provide access to uh, all walks of people as artists. And what I'm seeing as a challenge is access as audience members. Because as these men and women are developing their works, uh, from a dramaturgical perspective, I always ask them, consider your audience. Who is your audience? Who do you want to have be able to see this piece? And while we know that uh, that the act of creating art is essential to the well-being of the individual. Our company is, is founded uh, on the principle that, uh, hu that creativity is the most fundamental human impulse. Fish swim, birds fly, human beings create, we make things up. And, uh, and when we are connected to that creativity, things in ourselves, in our lives, in our families, in our communities get better and problems get solved. And when we are disconnected from that fundamental human impulse, that's when things go off the rails. And so the people that we are fortunate enough to work with have for a long time been disconnected. So things have gone off the rails. So we're, you, we're looking for that, that reconnection. So we've been able to work with a, a large number of people as artists. And then it's important to them to be able to create work and to be able to share that work. Uh, we had one person who was in our program in a, in a jail a few years ago, and uh, they had worked over several months to create a piece. They were ready to perform it for a public audience that was going to be coming in, and, uh, and he was scheduled to be released two days before the performance. And he went to the judge and asked if he could stay in jail for two more days so that he could perform this piece that he had created. And the judge said, Okay, you've been, you've been incarcerated, you're due to be released, why should I let you stay? Because of course, uh, they, it costs money to keep people in prison, right? Why should I let you stay? And he said, I realized over the process of doing this work uh, that every, uh, every problem I've ever encountered in my life is due to the fact that I've never completed anything I've started. I've never come to a successful conclusion in my education, in my relationships, in my jobs, in anything. And I really, really feel that it's important for me to be able to finish what I started here and be able to perform this piece. Thankfully, this compassionate judge allowed him to stay for two more days and he walked out the door right after having performed the piece that he created. So it's important to be able to provide that opportunity to create the artwork, but what I'm finding more and more is that a lot of our communities in which that work is being created don't necessarily have access to the audiences to whom they want to share their work. 
So how can we afford them the opportunity to get people in the room that need to hear their words to hear their words? And it doesn't just, uh, I'm not just talking about in uh, an institutional setting, although that is certainly a problem for me, right? So that like when I have a group that was supposed to have their final presentation today and there were gonna be people coming from all over to be able to see it, and I get a memo at the beginning of the week saying, oh, I'm sorry, all programs for this week have been suspended because we are gonna be conducting random searches throughout the facility all week long. Uh, cancel all your programs for this week um, and uh, we'll start back up again next week, right? So the, the effort that it takes to be able to get people there to see the work that's being done at a moment's notice can be tossed out the window but it made me think about the work that we're doing even on the outside in the theater companies that we run and the, the fantastic work that the artists are doing and who they need and want to have hear that work and are those the people that are in the audience? Do they have the opportunity to speak to the audiences that they want to reach? And whether that, uh, that isn't happening uh, because of ticket price, because of uh, theater accessibility because of um, the the opportunities that aren't there in the community to be able to bring those people in who need to hear those stories. How do we improve the access to our audiences so that the people who uh, our fabulous, diverse theater artists are creating work for are getting the chance to hear those stories? Thank you, Karen. Um, let's move on to Mina. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot about isolation. I don't know, how many of you were at the TCG conference that just happened? Um, Jeff Chang uh, did a remarkable plenary speech, which was so inspiring to me, and he talked about a lot about isolation and where uh, how we are in a moment of both uh, privilege, meaning we are allowed to isolate ourselves, we are allowed to um, think about self-accumulation -accu for self, and also to think of um, alienation and separation from. So I've been thinking a lot about that in terms of what, what our job is, and specifically for Crowded Fire, um, Jeff Chang said, our job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, which I think is <laughs> really brilliant. Um, and, and to that end, it's, you know, Crowded Fire, to give you a really quick history, since 2009 we've done about 98% uh, playwrights who are women, queer identifying, people of color. So we have a history, a deep history of representation on our stage. Um, last year alone, 75% of our casts were people of color, um, were women, directors and playwrights, and, um, and yes, so all of those things. And to what Carmen was speaking about, I'm going to get a little emotional here, it is to me not just about representation on the stage, it's actually what is happening within that organization. So like how, does, how, do, how has tokenism, then diversity, how have those two words become interconnected and how are we using that as a badge in the sam same way that organic became a badge for a period um, for our own theaters to say, hey, we're doing this work, it's on our stage, which is great, that's a first step. But then, you know, Jeff Chang also spoke to power because um, it's not just a question of programming, it's also a question of who's making the decisions. Who is um, stepping in and choosing, like who is in a position to power to choose the programming and how we are allowing access for people and our audiences to come into our theaters and how do they feel included? If they're looking around at a sea of white faces who are primarily 50 or 60 years old, how does that feel? Um, so I was also going to speak about the 17 roles because when I think about our local ecology, I think about three of those roles are right here. And I think a lot about, um, I'm thrilled to hear about the letter. Uh, I will absolutely sign it. And I think, you know, the minute the person who is running the organization shifts, it is a chance to fill that gap and to shift the entire genetics of an organization. And that is not something to be afraid of because look outside at, at the people that are walking around this is an America that is changing. 
and we're in a moment of fear right now. It's like paralysis. And at the same moment that these very fervent conversations are happening um, in the circles that I choose to include myself in, um, I was a little bit um, uh, bewildered and a little scared about some of the other conversations that were happening at the conference. So uh, I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable here for a moment, but what I was also hearing was about being uh, fearful, about choosing to be safe. Uh, so I was hearing some of our leaders talk about in this desire to reach over and be a bridge and have discourse with the conservative community and the liberal community, okay, that's really important, okay? But also, in order to do that, we were looking outwards. So we were thinking about, okay, how is our programming going to be about then bridging to that audience or community, the conservative community, but also not t making an acknowledgement about the fact that our own institutions and organizations look and feel a certain way. Um, and it became sort of a, it felt a little bit like a, somewhat disingenuous turn to that focus as opposed to saying, okay, yes, it does take courage to put people of color on our stage. Yes, I am gonna get hate mail. Uh, yes, I might be afraid to put more on my own personal Facebook page because they're going to see me as the face of the organization and see me as someone who might be radicalizing that community because I have these concerns about activism and, and access. And so I was hearing these in a lot of the rooms that I was in also who were filled by people who are leaders, who are artistic directors, who are managing directors. And I want us, I want to put our field um, in a, like high alert <laughs> to our own blind spots. And you, as Carmen said, are in the room. You are actually shaping decisions and you have this opportunity in this moment of leadership change and in this moment where we, also we need to be a bridge but we also need to be a battery and a point of inspiration for people who need to see their culture affirmed, their own sense of self affirmed on our stages and wherever our stage may be. And so it's a call to action um, that I feel most deeply and most fervently that I wanted to bring forward. And it has less to do with my per like the theater that I'm within. It has more to do with what is happening around us because we are all interconnected. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mina. Uh, let's pass the mic down to Gretchen. Hi. Um, so I'm with the Berkeley Playhouse, and um, the Berkeley Playhouse uh, produces uh, musicals for uh, intergenerational musicals. Um, and that is something that we're very proud of, but the, the heart and the soul of what we do at the Berkeley Playhouse stemmed from education. Uh, it started in the living room of Elizabeth McCoy's home, um, and I think that we have something, what, we, what I think about is how lucky we are that we have the youth, that we, we do classes, camps, and youth productions, as well as our professional um, season. And for us, we have a chance to really um, focus on what our students are really um, passionate about. Um, and we feel that, you know, we'll do the musicals and we'll find themes, though, in these musicals that resonate with what's happening today and try to bring some social justice into that. We've also started a new works program um, where we are commissioning for both our professional stage and our youth stage. Um, and anything that we are really, that we are commissioning right now has a social justice mes message. It's adapting something like an Alice in Wonderland and, and really focusing on Alice and, um, you know, have empowering her instead of making her a victim. Or in our youth stage, Robin Hood is a, is a female and her journey through that. And so we, I think we have something really special that we can focus on um, with our youth. On the other side of it, it's access. We we do pay what you can performances. We have done it this past year, and we really believe it's important for our community, uh, no matter uh, who you are, that you're able to see these productions. Um, and so all the grants that we're going after really are for access. It's for uh, being able to fund more per 
performances within that production so that next year we can actually do two performances per production. And those are our best audiences. People come two hours before to get in line to see these shows because they know that they won't be turned away at the door. And for us to be able to see this entire community there experiencing musical theater for the first time, there's nothing. Um, it just makes us uh, feel uh, like this is what we're supposed to be doing. Everyone should be able to see a show. Uh, along with that, we've also uh, started up again our student matinee program um, where we do stipends for buses because we found that for students, um, the problem is not maybe the tickets or th the tickets might be free, but it's access to get to the theater, it's the buses. And so we have gone after grants to allow a stipend for the buses. And so now we get children from 75 miles away who come to our student matinee programs. It's the first time they've been on a school bus. It's the first time they've gone through a tunnel. Um, it's the first time they've seen a live production and we get uh, incredible letters from these teachers and students saying that it was the most magical day of their life. They, they, they wear their Sunday clothes. I mean, they wear their best dresses and they, they, they feel so proud that they can be a part of something special. So for us, it's really trying to make, um, what we're trying to focus on is access and allowing everybody to come to see our pr productions. It's really educating our children and, and trying to reflect what's happening in the world in the productions that we're producing. And another thing that we're really proud of is our, uh, you know, is casting. We tr really try to um, uh, have everybody represented on stage. Um, but I do agree that it's not just about casting, it's about your, your organization. And we have a full female uh, leadership team, which I'm very proud about. Um, these women are fierce and fabulous, and we work together and we listen. and. We talk about all these incredible issues every day to make sure that we're staying on point with our mission and that we're reaching out to our community and really focusing on what's important for them. So. Thank you, Gretchen. Thanks. Um, now, Patrick, you're going to talk about both the organization he's been running for 25 years, but then also what it means to sort of step up and represent for a whole community. Um, I mean first of all, I just want to say like what an honor it is to be on the on this panel with all and listen to all of these incredible like I feel so I wish I'm having my notebook out um, to take down a lot of a lot of the things. I'm sure I'm a hearing. lot of people will share their notes with you. <laughs> great, right, great. Will you help Patrick out? Thank Please you. share. Um, there's so many things that people said that I'm I'm kind of a scattered. I'm gonna have to throw a lot of things out. Um, I, I think a lot about what it means. So first of all, as a straight white male. What I've really been thinking about a lot in the last few years is uh, how important it is for me to be quiet in the room and to listen. And I feel like that's uh, making space for there to be, uh, for, for other and letting things just be quiet for a while because a lot of folks are just used to someone like me taking over a conversation. And so just allowing the room to be quiet. I'm actually the only male on my staff, um, but, uh, but so what I'm learning right now is to be quiet and to allow other voices to come up and for allow there to be, to be more ownership over the direction of the organization. Um, the other thing I've been thinking a lot about also, I mean, oh, since the beginning, is what does it mean to be a 501c3 as a community service organization? And what does it mean for your organization to be of service to your community? And that means getting to know who is who your community is and how you can best serve them, whether that means putting solar panels on your roof so that you're not making a bigger f carbon footprint or buying all of your baked goods from the local bakery or making sure that you're not just your, your cast on stage, but that your the people sitting in your audience are reflective of the demographics of your community and not just the whole of Berkeley, but um, like South Berkeley where we live, which is really the only um, uh, community in, the, the in Berkeley that has have people of color um, left in it. And, and, and connected to that also, okay, I'm, I'm gonna kind of shift to my, my activist um, thing really quick here. I, have a, I was working actually for my aunt who's a, a congresswoman in New York City before I came into, uh, to, to do theater. And so I've always had a real activist uh, spirit in me. And I, I feel really strongly, uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about housing and, and and affordable housing and what and you know and, and you see it just because our artists are actually like not able to stay I mean most artists actually are living way below the poverty line they don't see themselves as people who are living below the poverty line but when they look at actually what they make and where they they're like oh my gosh you know how am I how am I living here and so I've been thinking a lot about how we as an arts organization and as a community in Berkeley can actually uh, spend time at City Council 
meetings, and I go to a lot of city council meetings, and I think that's something that I, as as um, as artists that we need to like get outside of our theaters and go to those meetings and get on those panels and it start affecting policy because that those th that policy that you are affecting that is having a ha having a massive ripple effect on your on your community on the people that you want to be serving, and uh, so it's not for me. I don't feel like it's enough that we just are making great plays. I feel like that's really important that we make great plays. But it's really important also that we are leveraging the fact that often as artists in a community, we are able to kind of intersect these worlds of the, the, the people that Mina referenced, that Jeff Chang, I'm like, oh, we want to we wanna make the, uncomfortab the comfortable people uncomfortable. But a lot of those comfortable people have lots of extra time to go see theater and to buy tickets and to do all that. And so they're in your audience. And so, you know, and they're, and they're at making decisions at those city council meetings. And so... You know, if we're able to get those folks, if we're able to kind of bring them around, um, and we're starting to see that happen now and raise, you know, issues that, that are important to artists, which are also very important to our community, then I feel like we can really make some systemic, large systemic changes in our community. Um, the other thing that, um, that and we're, gonna, we're all talking about Jeff Chang today. I mean, that guy, whew, Jeff Chang. I mean, I'm a Jeff Chang fanboy. And... Um, Jeff Chang also said something that I can't stop thinking about right now, which is that um, people talk a lot about empathy, how important it is that we're like creating empathy with our work, but that empathy without action is empty. And i like, that is the truth. So like, okay, I'm having all these feelings. I'm having all this empathy for you. Like, but what the fuck am I going to do about it? You know? And so uh, we have these conversations after all of our plays now where we have an opportunity. It's not like, how are the lights? How'd you learn all those lines? But like, you know, really, we, we break up into groups and have audience members talking with other audience members who don't look like them, who are different ages than them, who take different amounts of money than them, and talk about issues that are coming up in the play. And then we talk about them as a larger group. And then we talk about, then we ask them, now what are you going to do about that? What will you go, not like, oh, I'm going to go tell people about this play. Uh, okay, that's great. Thank you. But what else can you do? What are the things that you, as a, as a person in the community, you know, can do to, like, create the change that you've just been talking about needs to happen because of the story that you've seen? And so, uh, and, and people are really cut, are motivated to do that. And so part of what we're doing is, like, having those, um, having opportunities for people to engage with things at the theater. There's like there's organizations that they can, you know, sign up for. There's, this next meeting for this is here. There's a postcard you can fill out and write to your elected official. There's t ten of them already pre-addressed to all these elected officials, and you can write a thoughtful letter to them. So those are like even the little tiny things that we can do. Um, we want to do to create that accumulation because I do feel like you also talked about um, like the after the day after the election. Like it, this is our moment. Like, this is the most important moment I think we've had as arts organizations. Like, we are, like, the uh, community's turning to us, and they're like, what, you know, who's going to step up and do something? And we, we have a real opportunity here. And I think if we don't take that opportunity, if we let this moment slip away from us, um, that we will, you know, next generations will look at us and say, like, you guys just sat on your ass, you know, and, and didn't speak up. Um, I, I'm really... Uh, I feel really honored to be uh, living in a time where I know what the acronym EDI means and, and, and really excited about how the arts organizations, like they took this, the, the, the subject of gender parity a few years ago, that people weren't saying things like gender parity, you know, five, or maybe they were, but it wasn't in the zeitgeist. And then suddenly it's like how round, gender parity, gender parity, gender parity. And now like, okay, now arts organizations are paying attention to that. And now, you know, uh, the, the issues of EDI, we have a, we started an EDI committee in our organization that's made, that's comprised of staff, board, and company members, and brought somebody to speak to our board and company retreat so we could start to bring those issues up and change the culture in our organization. Um, we're looking at, you know, we brought on, you know, four new company members, and we had a conversation as an organization, like, we're only going to be, you know, inviting people of color into our organization from now on. That's just it, because we're, we've, we have hit our quotient of white folks. I love all those white folks. We're, we're, we're good with that. We're good with that. And it just changes the conversation. You know, when you change it, and it makes it a more dynamic conversation, it makes people are like, it makes the, the art better. It makes, the truth is, it's better for the organization. I mean, Mina was touching on this earlier. It's for our own survival. It's for our own good. People talk about how the art's going to be relevant. 
it's lowering up. Go for it. Thank you. That I wanted to last round. Who is? Pass and dark. Not. I am in a room. Love to tell not that we have. Hey. Hold on. So that's going to be our preferred pronouns as a matter of course. Um, so what we're going to do before we open up to discussions, I'm going I'm to share mine and ask all the panelists to state their full names and share their preferred pronouns. Um, so we start to engage. Thanks very much. Um, so we're going to uh, take some questions from the crowd, hopefully open up for discussion. Um, uh, and again, this is the beginning of our discussion for our whole three days. Um, so I think the uh, volunteers have uh, microphones. So we'll take the first one here, right here uh, on the aisle. Raise your hand high so the microphone can find you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, so please share your name and your preferred pronouns. My and then name we'll engage. is Amy Brooks, she, her, hers. Thank you. And uh, I don't know what EDI stands for. Could you please let us know? <laughs> Equity, diversity, inclusion. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions. We are fun people. So as they're fun people. We've got them for a short amount of time now. Let's um, get the engagement. Or if you want to share any comments of something they said that, that struck you. Great. We've got a couple in the back and one in front. So one, two, three. Great. Great. Hi. Uh, Phaedra Scott, she, her, hers. Thank you. So um, I'm really interested because 
some of you are like leaders of institutions, about how can we start that conversation about who should dramaturg what play? Um, and like, how do you think we can do that, but also still continue to maintain those conversations with the communities, but with that dramaturg who might not necessarily be a part of that theater? So I'm just wondering what your thoughts were about that. <laughs> Mina's going to answer that question. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think, you know, in terms of the EDNI work, we also are going through a massive uh, training as well as having real conversations. I mean, it's like, it starts with what is what are the themes in the play? Who's a playwright? Um, let's be honest about, you know, who, how, what kind of intentionality are we approaching the work with? Who has power in the room? Um, does a dramaturg, you know, how do we um, diversify and increase plurality in our dramaturg pool of uh, folks? Um, how do we also support emerging folks who are trying to figure out um, how they get in, whether it's coming out of school? And this is another thing is like, maybe they're, they're coming from a different area in our community. Um, so we're talking actually at our company meetings about that. Um, about how do we also define access and start reaching out to different organizations that are not theaters um, and start to think about increasing plurality that way. Um, in terms of figuring out who's best for what team, I think it, 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 it is that intentionality and thoroughness around what it is that the themes of that play are about, who the audience is, and how do we make sure that everyone has space and voice in the room also, so that it's not just someone there to put on that organic sticker for that production, that it's actually someone who has power in the room um, for that eventual production. Um, I just wanna add, I don't know if you all have this list, but I know uh, the uh, Production Managers Forum is creating a list of all the production managers and all the production folks of color. Uh, there's um, uh, the Kilroys, you know, the list of women and women of color, um, playwrights. Do you all have a list of dramaturgs of color or dramaturgs who are, um, you know, non-binary, uh, queer, of uh, dramaturgs who are uh, uh, queer identified? I, I actually think that uh, we do need that, we, d we do need to name that. And I also think that, because um, I know I'm in spaces where I hear folks say all the time, well, they don't, I mean, they don't really exist. We don't know anybody. Folks, I mean, actually, if we're going to have to make it that simple for folks, let's just make it that simple for folks. <laughs> let's just create the list. Do you all have a list? Okay, so there's a list that's been started. <laughs> exactly. I think, and part of it is some of us actually have to come out. We're, we, you know, we, uh, in, place in, in a way that feels safe for us, some of us might have to come out and say, you know, actually, um, I am non-binary, and I will bring that into the space when I'm in the space. We need that list of folks that so, so that we can see who you are and where you are. Um, and then the second piece, that's the first piece, can we get that list together, <laughs> like circulate that list? And then the second is um, some of us, when we're in the space, we need to say, actually, no, no, I'm not the right one. I, I, I promise you, I'm not the right one. Here is this list. We need to start doing more of that. Some folks are doing it, and we actually need to start doing more. Um, and just one more thing, this is something that we've applied in our organization towards designers and technicians that can actually be applied to dramaturgs. We found an anonymous donor and we've started a grant um, to increase plurality in the Bay Area around designers and technicians. So it's actually a $10,000 um, bucket of money. And so we have a yearly granting um, uh, and panel and granting process so that we're, we're moving towards that because we also need this in those spaces. But Maybe somebody out there, if you are connected to various donors at your theaters, maybe somebody would be willing to step in and do something similar for um, the dramaturgs. This is a great example of what we want this conference to do, which is like, there's an idea, there's a need, what are we gonna do about it and put this in? And while this idea has come up before, I think we're now at a, a critical mass. Like we have to do it. We have a, a long tradition of institutions that had uh, if they were lucky enough to have an institutional position for a literary manager or a dramaturg, that person um, was expected to be able to dramaturg every play. And you know that's just not, it's not appropriate um, for certain projects. 
and you need to every artist needs to be able to ask um, uh, themselves I might not be the right person for this and to have access ready access to a list where there's self-identified affinities and specializations to be like oh actually there's five people who would be much better at this. Let's see if we can get one of them you know, to work on it. So not just internationally in our organization, but really locally, and we're gonna try to strengthen our local teams and regions to see who also has access based on geography um, too. And if that's not possible, who can I reach to to do some long, uh, long distance collaboration, which we can do, absolutely. So that's one of the things, so thank you for that. Yes, question here. Oh wait, no, we had a couple more, there's a queue. It was like Diane. No, Laura. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, good. Um, the art equity training yesterday was phenomenal, and I'd never seen anything like it, participated in anything like it. Um, I do participate in the NNPN EDI committee, and in all of these different conversations, the inflections are slightly different due to the concerns of the given organization. What structures are in place for these organizations to co communicate with one another and possibly to publish joint things and you know, to span? the suite of concerns. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation on this very same thing. Uh, um, I, I think it, some funder was saying, what's the next thing we need to do now? And listen, when a funder asks you what's the next thing, have an answer, <laughs> have an answer. Um, and one of the things I do, I, I, what I'm worried about is um, a lot of duplication. Uh, so I'd, I'd like us to tighten this up. Uh, I'm also worried about um, folks you know, um, everyone's got a diversity committee. Uh, some of y'all have diversity and inclusion committees, and some of you have even equity committees. Everybody's got some sort of committee. But I, I, what I am experiencing is the integrity is not the same. Um, and I'm also experiencing a whole lot of fundraising for this work, a whole lot of grant writing. And uh, I know I'm gonna make some folks uncomfortable, but let me just say, there are organizations that have been doing this work for a long time with some sweat equity, and <laughs> they are not getting these grants. Um, and what's happening now is, I, I know you had a question, I'm gonna come back to it, but because I've got the microphone, I wanna just put this out there. Um, we've got to figure out how this ecosystem does not continue to perpetuate these, these, disp these disparities. So you have these predominantly white institutions, wonderful, you are, getting a clue that you should probably open yourselves up and you're going after and getting the biggest grants that are out there to do equity, diversity, and inclusion, and then maybe subcontracting. Let, let's just name that and let's figure out a way to interrupt that. Like you need to be making sure that you're involving theaters of color, artists of color um, in these conversations. You need to go hand in hand at the funder and have a joint plan as opposed to um, what I see happening in some instances. But back to your question. Uh, so how do we minimize duplication and how do we get uh, together? I think some of what I've been seeing at these conferences is working. The affinity spaces are actually now creating another space where they're all together. Um, Black Theater Commons, Latinx Theater Commons, Kata, um, gosh, there's a whole bunch of them. Leslie Ishii is here with the National, um, uh, shout it out. Thank you. The Nat the Natural Cultural Navigational Theater Project. I think that it's now time for a conversation that has a long game uh, and a little more strategic visioning. I think that we've gotta do the capacity building and the day-to-day -day stuff for sure, but I do think that we now need to link up strategically to share um, resources, to share strategic thinking. It's time, it's time. I don't see enough of that happening. That to me feels like the next kind of frontier, for lack of a better. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for this panel, and there are a couple of panelists who have to jam. So what I want to do um, is first thank the panelists for their time this morning. Thank you all. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was so engaged in the conversation. I'm like, oh, it's time. Um, uh, but, but we do have a break. If you have to jam, jam now. I'm going to give some quick... Um, Instruction. So we have a 15 minute break now. What we've decided to do for this conference, um, rather than like have a coffee station out there and people don't drink coffee, is patronize uh, the local establishment. So we have a cafe right here. Um, there's Zing Cafe next door. Um, so feel free to do those. I, um, if you want to, uh, where's my, oh, I forgot to 
Oh, oh it's here. Um, so so we're sa- we, uh, we have um, these fantastic mugs that say, um, keep calm and trust a dramaturg. Um, um, they're for sale up front, as well as these lovely t-shirts, um, because our uh, conference registration fees only cover a fraction of the cost of the conference, so we're raising money in other ways. Um, please spend some time in the space. I mean, le- in the ramp lobby, you'll see this amazing um, photo mural. Get to know the space. See what organizations are in this building. There's a fantastic sunny terrace out on the second floor. Um, so go there during the break. And then uh, at 10.30, we're going to be in four spaces. So um, right here on this stage, Jeff Janiszewski is around here somewhere. Yeah, Jeff is going to continue the local theater conversation with another um, group of panelists in um, Osher A, uh, which is on the left. Coriana is uh, pointing that out. Um, we're going to be uh, have um, presentations. One, We Don't Shut Up, The Dramaturgy of the Flint Water Crisis um, by Jen Plants. And then All the World's a Rage, Theater of Revolt and Dramaturging Social Insurrection by Vivian Chase. In Osher B, The Middle Room, we're going to have uh, a praxis session, Failing to Transform, Explorations of Creative Failure and Emergent Strategy uh, with Mia Susan Amir and Davy Samuel Calderon. And then in Osher C, so you can see everything. It's fantastic. It's so accessible. Um, we're going to have a roundtable about dramaturgy and the arts integrated campus um, led by Scott Horstein. So that's what we're going to do um, in less than 15 minutes. So please get some... Uh, refreshments here at this cafe or next door and also to like just know that like we saved all the hospitality money for the banquet which is gonna have an open bar so (laughs) just like bear with us and then you'll get it and it'll be like all-inclusive at the banquet so thank you thank you to the panel